Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Eternum Labs podcast. Today we have a very special guest on the show, the muscle doc, Jordan Shallow. And if you're interested in anti-aging, living your best life, performing at your peak, increasing your longevity and being in your best health, you would know that resistance training and muscle building directly correlates and directly has benefits to improving all of those. Jordan Shallow is the best in the industry when it comes to optimizing yourself, building muscle, and all of those different things that I mentioned just beforehand. And if you're interested in anything that Jordan has to offer, you can follow his podcast, you can follow him on social media, or you could attend or join some of his courses that he has available for you to do in regards to everything, optimization, nutrition, muscle building, and learning about biomechanics and all of the extra goodies in there. If you guys already don't know, we have a massive range of supplements. Ranging from Lion's Mane, we have a product called Zen, which helps you get to sleep. We have a product called Zone, which helps you focus and get into the zone without any caffeine or stimulus. We have NMN, which is anti-aging, increases your NAD levels and improves your energy. We have Resveratrol, which is also anti-aging, increases your energy and improves blood flow and we have vitamin B1. If you're interested in optimizing yourself and you want to get some of these really good products, just head to our website eternumlabs.com.au and you can find and choose the best products which are going to best serve you. So without any further ado guys, I hope you guys enjoy this podcast as much as we did and we'll see you in the next one. G'day Jordan, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, all good. So what have you got? You know, we were just talking off camera beforehand about your travels and stuff at the moment and the struggles with COVID and actually getting around. But what's your main focus at the moment? What are you currently working on? Uh, writing primarily, writing in the podcast. So just got back into Canada after what was a crazy, I mean, it seems like a crazy three years traveling, but uh, this particular trip was the better part of the last like eight to nine months. So I did a lot of stuff kind of all over. Um, but now that I'm back in kind of like what we'll call home base for now, it's the, the main shift has been writing to textbooks and getting our podcast studio up and cranking. Awesome. I love that. So what is involved with the textbooks? Right. So I own um, a continuing education company in, in sort of the fitness and healthcare space uh, called Prescript. So We have seven continuing education courses that vary from barbell specific to functional anatomy, applied biomechanics specific um, curriculum. And I develop all those and I write the accompanying texts that go with it. So I finished the level one manual uh, late last year and we have like an additional course to that. Obviously the prerequisite for a level two and the level two manuals in the hopper at the moment. And then we have a barbell specific course that's in need of a manual it's actually quite lengthy. So that's like basically uh, progressions, regressions, adaptations, optimizations, assessments around like the big three squat bench and depth. So that's been like a big, that's, that'll be our biggest, that'll be our biggest textbook yet. Um, the word count has already exceeded the level one and it's probably halfway done. So um, just a lot of thinking, sit in this room and just, that's a whiteboard. I draw on that for a bit. I type some stuff. I think some more, I type some more of that stuff down. Yeah, so mostly, mostly that, man. It's, it's quite the process. Yeah, so you just kind of get into that room, get locked in and get cranking. That's it, man. Most mornings, just you catch yourself in that unconscious, conscious state. You just start letting the fingers do what they want to do. And you know, I look up four hours later and the rest of the world wakes up and then I can start my work day. Yeah, it's fun, man. I, I enjoy it. It helps me collect, collect my thoughts in a way that where you think it make things make sense in your head. And then when you realize as they just spill out of every orifice in your face, just through your fingers, it's like, that makes no sense at all. I'm not going to get away with selling that. So it helps you organize, bin and categorize your thoughts pretty well. I enjoy it. Yeah. And you've been like, I'm assuming that you've, because you've been teaching this stuff all around the world, that you've been teaching and learning and teaching and learning. So it sort of got to that point where you're like, yep, time to write a book down. I think so. Yeah. And I think it's not until you, really like work out your material in front of a live audience that you can get it to a point where you can write it down. Um, So I've been lucky enough to be doing this for a handful of years now. I've got a lot of reps in in front of that live audience. So 
yeah, the written stuff comes much easier after you can kind of get the reps in. Uh, there's some new stuff that I'm writing that I haven't presented live yet. Uh, but you, cause you get the feedback, like, you know, the audience that shows up will be the audience that reads it, but you don't, you're blind to their interpretation of your word. So if I can put things together and trial different organizations of thoughts and different organizations of sentence structure and do that in real time and look and be like, well, oh, they get that when I say it that way, um, then it's just much easier and you're much more confident when you, you know, when you pen it down and publish it in the whole, the whole nine yards. Yeah. So what are some of the things that as you've been teaching that you think have been some of the biggest takeaways that people have been like listening in and you've been like, you know, do, doing the certain lectures, doing the talks. And then someone's just been like that, what you just said there is like the most helpful thing ever. Have you got any of those experiences or um, stories that you could share? Yeah. There's a few concepts where like, you know, like a comedian knows when he's going to get a laugh. I know when I'm going to reach or like a revelatory state where like someone's like, I can see where the dots start to connect. Um, <laughs> You know, the difference between strength and stability is one from a very surface level that seems to click pretty quickly with people. It's like they knew it, but they didn't know how to describe it. Uh, the difference between mechanics and biomechanics and like how we're sold this sagittal plane stick figure drawing with moment arms and torques and measurements and all this stuff is biomechanics, where biomechanics is actually much more like a subjective interpretation of quality of movement rather than like an objective calculation of quantity of movement. Um, so that's something that, that you always see like some light bulbs go off for injuries, like breaking down an injury from like applied force greater than tissue tolerance and understanding that most, you know, rehabilitation protocols are like based merely on the pursuit of increasing tissue tolerance where they should actually be based around, uh, decreasing the applied force, uh, use an analogy of like, I had a client, I come from like a less than savory part of Canada come from the hood essentially and i had a client who got stabbed three weekends in a row um it's just it is what it is um but my advice to him was never to you know put on like strap himself full of phone books and go out to the club my advice was like hey maybe don't go to that club on Pulisher avenue because that would you know for me just be like hey strap yourself full of phone books would be the same as like hey do terminal knee extension because you're patella tendon hurts like that's stupid you're trying to just build the tissue tolerance rather than asking the smarter question of like why are you applying so much force to that tissue to begin with so that's kind of like a few topics off the top of my head where like when i get the analogies right and i can make like a few ghetto references and shit people are like oh okay like i get it now so a lot of what i do is like figuring out comparison like how is it that i can explain higher level concepts with very surface level analogies and um you know metaphors and similes and stuff like that which is like part of the challenge but most of the fun is being able to like make two comparisons that most people would never think that you could make so that's that i would enjoy that part almost the most of the whole process yeah finding the parts where you see people go oh and they get the moment you're like yes nailed it yeah yeah i love yeah. that so where did you learn all of this stuff? Like what, are, where did it, where did it come from for you to get like real passionate and start to dive in and, and learning? Cause some of those concepts and like that you talk about, are, like the most advanced, <laughs> like, they're the most yeah. advanced that I know. So I'm like, where, where, where's these inputs? Where do you get all this? Yeah. I mean, I was lucky, man. Like I got indoctrinated into training. My first training partner was, I mean, I still look to him for, you know, sound bites and cues and thought processes around training. And he's just, you know, his name's Luke Bernaches. He's a trainer in my hometown. He was my personal trainer when I first started and like, you know, was just jacked out of his mind and like real smart. So I started training with him. So my base level knowledge of what I thought was like bro science was actually like very well developed thought process. So I got a head start, I think, in that sense. And from there, like he indoctrinated this, you know, he was always reading and about everything to do with getting in better shape. Uh, cardio protocols, nutrition, fat loss, supplementation, the whole nine yards. I found a, um, I was playing sport at the time. I was a competitive hockey player. So I found more of like my application drawn or more of my attention drawn to the application around sport and training, which like quickly led me down the route of like Charles Poliquin was probably the first and most influential. So I started reading Charles's stuff when I was 15, 16. So in 2005, 
um, and really sort of dove head first into that and started putting some of that stuff into practice and started developing my own ideas and then starting to put those, those ideas into practice with other people. And, um, then, you know, going through like a kinesiology program and then that into like chiropractic field and really getting to know anatomy inside and out, um, uh, you know, like with cadaver labs and, uh, just being able to be hands-on from a day to day was super helpful. Um, so you get to hone that skill, that subjective quality of movement, uh, pretty quickly when you get that kind of exposure, that sort of frequency and magnitude of exposure. And that just mixed with my own training. Like I, you know, I got into competitive powerlifting in 2000 and 2017, 2016. Um, I was just, you know, I was surrounded by this, literally a couple of the strongest guys in the world in my weight class and was able to excel uh, pretty fast, just having all of those tools at my disposal and then having this, you know, the access to, to high level thinkers. And I think more importantly, like high level doers, like my first patient was a competitive powerlifter in California named Dan Green. The head judge at my second meet was Ed Cohn, who's like the greatest powerlifter of all time. Um, and now he's like a close friend of mine. One of my other closest friends is, and I don't want to just be this guy that name drops, but like, you know, Stephanie Cohen's a really close friend of mine. She's a physical therapist and a really good powerlifter. Really good. Some would say that she's the best. I, I'd be a little weird, <laughs> which isn't fair. She's okay. She does. She, she goes all right. So yeah, just like, you know, that just always just staying curious and pushing the envelope and reading and doing and reading more and doing more and being able to travel and get honestly i think it's the access to questions that is super helpful now mm. like i seem to be a concentrated funnel for people to send their inquiries so I, like i teach i teach two of our flagship courses uh the level one and the level two and so i get to funnel uh, i'm the, the the tip of the spear for like the questions that come through you know a couple hundred students a semester and they're i, I think they're all pretty high level to start and they're hopefully in the four months that these courses run that they're even higher level to leave. So I think I, I get a, a curiosity concentrate that is super valuable that each one has their own curiosity that they bring to the table. So I get like a, um, I get to, like to keep my finger on like a meta pulse of like what, what the industry's like really like what the inquiries are. And then I guess I go you know, just sit on my computer and hunt down answers or get on my phone and start calling people and start piecing some stuff together. So it's, it's a unique position to be in for sure. That's a good position to be in. I guess you're getting first access to everything that everyone sort of really needs and you can provide the best quality stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's nice. The community we've cultivated is very inquisitive and people just want to know, like, oh, they always want to know the first thing that comes to mind. And then we all sort of collectively go to, well, it's, yeah, it's like, like, you know, it's a knee jerk reaction. And then we all kind of dig deeper on it. And we're all hopefully at a point where we just go, I was way off. It's actually this, or we were kind of close and it was, it was that, but uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's fun, man. Like it keeps you on your toes for sure. Oh, for sure. How important do you think it is for people to be like strength and resistance training in general from what you've seen? Uh, it depends, man. Like I, I definitely have to be wary of my biases and the fact that I attract people who are more prone to it, understanding that that's like not a large part of the cross section of the population. Um, I think it fulfills a need. I don't necessarily know if everyone needs to do it. Um, I think people need to fulfill whatever that need is. Like to me, psycholog psychology trumps physiology all day. And I'm a physiology guy. Um, but even I'm not, um, you know, full of enough hubris to be like, no, like everyone needs to swap bench and like, I think that's just silly. <laughs> I think there's, there's a need that, that resistance training can, it's almost like maybe here's a comparison. I guess this is like kind of what I do. I would say it's the same relationship between like a vegetarian or vegan maybe, and like getting all of their amino acids. I like think it's probably harder to go in and find all the essential and non-essential from fucking lentils or chickpeas or whatever the fuck people eat that don't eat meat it's just way easier to just grab a fucking porterhouse and just dome the ass of a fucking cow uh so it's probably similar like you know can you get the health benefits of what you need to a certain degree i think so like you know can you get the 
bone density qualities of resistance training by other means? Probably. Is it going to be as efficient as just putting a fucking bar on your back every now and then? Probably not. So I would say that's probably like an adequate, I know plenty of very athletic, very capable, being a fuck, I work with a handful of guys in the National Football League here in America or North America that are vegan and they're monsters uh, because all it is, is it's, you know, you know, you're, isoleucine, leucine, valine, methionine, phenylalanine, all the other fucking amino acids, and you just get them by all I mean, it's annoying, and I'm just going to like, I'm going to eat this dead thing. Um, but they don't jive that way, and that's cool. And I know people who are healthy that don't lift weights, and that's cool too. So like, I'm not like super dogmatic. It's just like, you need the end result. You need to scratch that itch. Physiologically and psychologically, resistance training doesn't have to be the method in which you do that, or the vehicle in which that gets done. So but it's still a good vehicle. <laughs> it's a very efficient vehicle. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. No, I really like that. So what would you say to someone, let's say, um, they've been training for a while and they've really sort of wanted to take it up to another level. They've done like a few programs. They've figured some things out, but they're like, All right, I really want to get in touch with myself, um, touch with my body um, and start to like focus on some advanced techniques and some advanced things. What would be like a... Uh, sort of either like what would like the processes that you would either go through or talk about or discuss to sort of point someone in the right direction, especially if they are into like strength and like um, increasing their like uh, body's resistance. Yeah, I think understanding like anatomy and to a certain degree biomechanics is like it's your ones and zeros, like it's your source code. So like I don't know how familiar your audience would be with like coding, but as like your computer is just a bunch of ones and zero. So you have like these things called bits and the number of bits in your operating system basically indicate your computing power, right? So there's like, or well, there's one bit, two bit, four bit, eight bit, 16, 32, 64, 130 something, 132, something like that. Mm -hmm. and, and so 256, I think is the next one. Um, so these, the computing power is based off of the number of ones and zeros and those designations indicate how many ones and zeros this computer has. So, you know, to take it to the next level, I, I'll make the comparison. Yeah, this is like, I, my first computer, I think ran Windows 95, dating myself now. Yeah, it was Windows 95. And that computer had some Intel negative five processor or something like that. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Some stupid, inefficient, but like I could basically pet, I could play solitaire and maybe be on MSN Messenger, which was like the Facebook, Instagram, everything all at once. Yeah, uh, application, messaging application. And like, just that was a amount of computing powder I had. Like, I don't even think I could play music at that time. Maybe I could play like a Blink 182 song or something. But if I had to, if I tried to go on Kazaa or LimeWire or Napster and download like a Metallica album, my computer was like, fuck you. Like, there's yeah, no way this it is shut that. down so bad. It just didn't have the ones and zeros, right? So it's the same thing with the body and like understanding the body, like understanding your, your ones and zeros, like understanding and building like a repertoire, building a reservoir of your, you know, bits in your operating system ultimately allow you to just execute more complex programs. It's no different than this. Like me and you, we're on the other side of the fucking world. I'm on a thing no bigger than, you know, a stack of papers with these headphones and all of this stuff. And I got, you know, I got 10,000 tabs open in the background, like literally 10,000. I'm counting them, there's 10,000. And it's just like Kajabi's up on one. I got a few Shopify tabs. I don't know, Spotify's open. I got like this password authenticator software running. I got a bunch of, it's like the only way this is possible is because this has more ones and zero. The only way I'm able to run these complex programs is because of the ones and zero. And it's the same thing with like human movement. It's like, you need to be able to, a lot of people are trying to run complex programs, literally like exercise programs without the ones and zeros. So it's like understanding your anatomy and understanding like the biomechanics, like understanding the potential of your internal environment and the range of your external environment and how the external influences the internal 
is aligning your ones and zeros with the adequate level of complexity of the programs you're attempting to run. So a lot of people are just running. You're trying, they're trying to run Zoom and Skype and Google Chrome and you know all this other Spotify, Shopify, all this other stuff on a computer that's really meant to play solitaire mm. and maybe like a song. And it's like, you need to be able to slowly and incrementally increase that work capacity, increase that, com increase that computing power. Um, so I think that's the biggest asset is really understanding your ones and zeros, understanding like the functional anatomy and applied biomechanics. That okay. sort of, go ahead. Yeah, so, so how would you actually do that in terms of like, if you were to understand more of your body, like how would you? Pick up a book or well, <laughs> that's why I created a course or seven <laughs> courses was uh, not to be a shameless plug, but like, yeah. No, like start with insertion and origin. Most people have no idea. Like start with like, where does, like, what is your, and you don't have to be like super rain man with it. Like you don't need to be like, your pec inserts at the lateral lip of your bicipital groove and the lat inserts at the floor of the intertubercular groove. It spans from T6 to T12 down L1 to L5, William sacrum, lower yeah. ribs onto the inferior angle of the scap. Yeah. It's cool <laughs> to do that. But at the same time, it's like, it can literally be as simple as that. Just like, Oh, like, what's this? Well, this is the clavicular portion of your pec major, right? This runs to the medial two-thirds border of the clavicle to the lateral lip of the bicep. Well, what's this? This is your sternal. Oh, this is their costal. How do, well, how do I challenge different? Like, you can literally just start with a single question, like pulling on the thread. But I think anatomy is just so... I don't know. I mean, whatever. People have... People have lied. I don't know how to pay my taxes. I don't have a fucking clue. I literally have to sign over power of attorney to my accountant and be like, yeah, I don't know, man, just make sure I don't end up in jail. <laughs> and, but my accountant doesn't know what his, you know, sternocleidomastoid is. And that's cool too. But if people are trying to make, my accountant knows what a PNL sheet is. A lot of people are trying to make their business training and it'd be the equivalent of my accountant not knowing what a PNL sheet is. Like, Motherfucker, you better know what, if I'm turning over power of attorney, I know what a profit loss is. But if it's, you don't know what, you know, a subclavius is, if you don't know what a multifidus is, if you don't know what a, I don't know, a plantaris, palmaris, and deltoid, posterior fiber, like, then you're going to be a fitness professional? What? <laughs> no, stop it. But it's out there, man. So I think that's like, that's the best asset, man. It's just like, the more you know, the more you grow, I think. Oh, for sure. And I think like, like in terms of actually, like we have, like I always think like we have this body, right? And it's the only one that we've got. And there is so much going on that it's ridiculous, like every single day. And there's so many muscles and there's so much happening and there's so much this here, that here, that was going on. And then like you can go into the gym and like pick an, an exercise like the deadlift, move two little things like, in certain ways and it just changes the whole lift. <laughs> of what you're doing which could which could either injure you tomorrow or really help you to grow get stronger and um, feel better mm. which is like but that's the way that's the way good things often work though right like think of splitting the atom you can go in and split the atom one way and you can light up the entire island of a trip you can go in and split it the other way and you could have fucking hiroshima Right, like it's the same things that are effective usually exist on that. Their efficacy exists on that pin, uh, that the head of a needle. Right, like if not, you're just I don't know. You're just a, a fucking naturopath selling snake oil. Like you know, how much of this? How much of this uh, cedar lavender do I need to take? Oh, take as much as you can. It's like, well, it's obviously not doing anything. If I take so much of it, I could just can't take infinity amount of it. That's so dumb. Like I should be able to overdose on this if it's good. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I like that. That's really good in terms of like naturopath recommendations too. So I love a lot of the naturopath stuff. But yeah, I should be able to overdose on lavender oil. Oh, they got me. Fucking hate it. I yeah. fucking hate it. <laughs> yeah. I don't use too much lavender oil. But still that's my right. girlfriend, dude, a hand to God, my girlfriend came the first day the first night she stayed over, she like sprayed my, my pillow, her pillow. I'll have to fact check this. Um, I definitely know. But she sprayed, I think, her pillow with lavender. I was like, this could very well be the last night that you ever did that. <laughs> I, like dead I just can't do because it's like if things are effective, like 
it's funny. I talk a lot about relationships, human and otherwise statistical mathematical relationships, like having an understanding about like of relationships and how things relate to one another is how I'm able to bring things that are complex and find their, their layman's terms parallel is understanding how two things relate to one another. A normal distribution in statistics is a bell curve. That's normal. See, so if you went up to a statistician, it was like, yeah, it presents through a normal distribution. And we know what normal means. Normal is the baseline. Normal is how most things are assumed to work. The normal distribution is something that goes like this, comes up, and then comes down. So you're going to tell me that the fucking lavender oil just skyrockets to infinity with those dependent relations? Like, get the fuck out of here. It's nonsense. I said, just like, am I, am I am, is a homeopathic doctor, which is like an extra type of criminal. It just sells you nonsense. So anyway, that's my little rant on that for the day. <laughs> I like that. Like you can, you can apply some like advanced stuff to something <laughs> so simple. That's the key. That's what he's always doing. No, I like that. Um, what do you think would be like in terms of like people who are listening to this podcast? And if someone really wanted to get like a tool that they can use and go away like, oh, I listen to Corey and um, Jordan talking about some stuff. Um, I want to go try this this week in terms of something like tangible to actually do. What would you think that something that you've been working on recently that you sort of figured out or understood that you think would be like a really good recommendation? Uh, that's hard because those two, a lot of what I work on now is like much more advanced mm-hmm. and more advanced in principle. And the thing is like the teaching exercise in theory based is almost useless because it only exists in application. Uh, so I would challenge someone, okay, here might be something that, and I'm not going to give the, the deeper, more uh, uh, neurologically derived adaptation or pathway or brain mapping or anything like that, unless you want to, because I think it's really fucking cool. Yeah. Can if we- you're, <laughs> uh, if you want to, so if yeah. you, <laughs> okay, so I would challenge, I would argue that the majority of people who listen to podcasts in general probably squat in front of a mirror. And I would, and look, I was, I was the same. I learned how to squat in a commercial gym, but I realized it wasn't until I started training for powerlifting and I was in these like kind of dodgy, dusty powerlifting gyms that I mean, there was no mirrors that I didn't actually know how to squat. Now, mind you, like before I walked into a powerlifting gym, I could squat, I don't know, like over 250 kilos, no problem. And I got into a powerlifting gym and even with the, you know, a 250 kilo plus squat at a commercial gym, in front of a mirror, I realized I actually didn't know how to squat. I knew how to fix my squat. Right. So that's something that if you listen to this, like go just, and it's always the annoying fat powerlifter at the commercial gym who squats the other way, who like has a suitcase full of chalk and he's going to be in the rack for four hours. But it's like, I would argue like most people would benefit from like a mobility standpoint if they actually squatted, not facing the mirror. So you can improve your range of motion in your squat by not watching yourself squat. Now there's like a really deep neurological reason as to why that is. Yes, and it's please. Re- Go deep. Okay, it's literally going to be the rest of the podcast. Are we going to get a seatbelt? <laughs> yeah, you should, get, you should probably get like something get, to drink. Where's my, where's my to whiteboard? To get my, bring my whiteboard down from stairs or I start Go to the notes. bathroom. Just go to the bathroom now. You can go <laughs> during this. No, so like your brain has a bunch of different, I mean, there's a, different, a lot of different ways to categorize your brain, right? Like you can, um, you can map it based off of function. You can map it based off of location. If you map your brain off of like location, you have like your frontal lobe, which is more important for like cognition, right? When people, at least you think people were crazy, at least you can frontal lobotomies, right? Like one flew over the cuckoo's nest ship. Um, and you have your parietal lobe, which is behind that. Then you have like your occipital lobe and you have, um, your temporal lobe and you have this thing in your brainstem, which is three parts. And you have this thing behind your brainstem called your cerebellum. Yeah. Your cerebellum is kind of like, yo. Oh, so that's like all your reptile stuff, right? Yeah, kind of. Your cerebellum is your movement brain. Yep. So like, you know, your occipital lobe has a lot to do with like vision and you see vision a lot of places in, in your brain, more so than almost any other sensation. Like we are, we're meant to be. Although the three mask and the welders thing and the beekeepers outfit might say otherwise, but we're meant to be like predators. We're meant, we have very acute vision for, you know, mammals, our size. So 
vision is kind of everywhere. The cerebellum is like this little walnut shaped thing at the edge of your ba- uh, brain stem. It has sort of like three functional components. I look at your cerebellum like a beacon and it's, it's a beacon that shines light out into your body to, to get feedback, to know where you are in space. It's like creates, it like creates an internal motion capture. Right. So if we think of like Andy Circus from Lord of the Rings wore that lycra suit with all the little ping pong balls on it and that fed off to a central processor. Our brain keeps like, I'm not looking at my big toe, but I know where it is. Now there are people who don't have big toes who know where the big toe is, right? Like that's phantom yeah. limb syndrome, right? Which is like I have a friend who's missing his lower part of his left leg. And motherfucker, that thing gets itchy. It's in <laughs> 700 pieces in downtown Fallujah. But it's this brain sending a beacon out, right? So the cerebellum is like this movement brain. Sort of like so a sonar, like a bat or a whale. When that's a really good way to look at it, like an echolocator or yeah, something like that. But with yeah, light. You, with light, with sound, with whatever. We just have inputs that feed into this. Yeah. So I look at like the cerebellum like a, like a dimmer switch. I don't have a dimmer switch in this room. We have like a little, I have a little slider on my computer where I can kind of turn the brightness up and turn the brightness down. So we have things that shine into the cerebellum or send inputs into the cerebellum. And the goal is to get those shining as bright as possible. So the cerebellum itself doesn't have to send out looking for things. It can see beacons on other hills and know where they are. It can get that. It can locate that, uh, those different aspects that feed into it and get a very efficient signal. Now, these three major systems that feed into the cerebellum are going to ultimately cause the cerebellum itself to decrease how much light it needs to emit out. Because the cerebellum, when, you know, think of like when a, a power goes out in a building and they have emergency lights that run on back, back, backup generators, those emergency lights are not energy saving lights. They are burn as bright as possible to illuminate as much of the room as possible. They're very aggressive on the eyes. They're not like soft glow. Like I kind of a little like there's a there's a temperature, there's a warmth to this thing. Like this is this is yeah. you know this is some high class quality shit here. I gotta stay in this office all fucking day. Yeah. This is not by accident. I don't have an emergency light here because it's like I don't want to pay the fucking bill for keeping that fluorescent nightmare on. I also don't want to sit here like oh, god damn some like, bitch. I don't want to sit under that. <laughs> Right, like the sun is watching me. It's not the sun. We have studio lights in our podcast, and dude, they're a fucking nightmare. But they illuminate the entire room. It's really good for cameras. So the idea is back to our original point. I told you it's going to be is when we look in the mirror, we're actually diminishing a major beacon's contribution into shining light in the room and forcing our cerebellum to to blast this inefficient, blinding, immobilizing sort of beacon out from our brain down into our, down into our body. So like we have three major beacons that feed into this central beacon of the cerebellum. One is called your spinal cerebellum. The other is called your vestibular cerebellum. And the other, the third is called your cerebral cerebellum. So real quickly, like your vestibular cerebellum has a lot to do with your eyes and has a lot to do with your balance centers in your brain. Right. Um, and so this is primarily where we kind of run into some issues. It's like, you know, we're over utilizing this because we can see ourselves in real time. Mm-hmm. Right. So we're, we're, this is actually diminishing our input from our spinal cerebellum. Our spinal cerebellum is like all of our peripheral inputs from like, um, you know, I'll use the word muscle. So there's muscle spindles, there's nociceptors, there's Golgi tendon organ reflex, there's, uh, these things called Ruffini endings, Merkel's disc, Meisner's corpuscles, all these different nerve endings that are responsive to different stimulus that are outside our body. So if we we're thinking about the Andy Circus, uh, Lord of the Rings analogy, they would be the equivalent of like all those little ping pong balls on his suit, right? So it's like if he moves his wrist, Gollum, the Smeagol character's wrist move. Now these can be different receptors, right? They can be wired for heat. They can be wired for touch. They can be wired for skin stretch. They can be t- wired for pain they can be wired for proprioception and proprioception is like one of the big ones and we know it's big because it moves the fastest to the brain so proprioception moves through what's called an a alpha fiber and it moves at a rate of like 120 meters per second so proprioception it's relayed by this nerve ending called a muscle spindle and a muscle spindle is active more so at end ranges of motion where joints become unstable so they really what gives us stability so if i'm looking in a mirror 
I'm not really relying on these peripheral ping pong balls to be shooting a light up into my brain so my brain can see where I am in space, right? It doesn't have to shine a light because I have my eyes telling me where I am in space. So I have this really bright, you know, my dimmer switch is, is, is phased all the way up and my cerebellum is looking, pro, like trying to send light down into my body. Being like, Who the fuck are all these proprioceptors and like the rest of these peripheral inputs sending their beacons? How come they're not sending their beacons? And that can be, that can stop us from moving into ranges of motion because it limits our ability to entrust our appendages with their ability to resist force as they advance into further unstable position. So like switching that over time and allowing people to rec- rely more heavily on those peripheral inputs shining their light into the cerebellum can decrease that dimmer switch, can start to bring the overall tone of the body down so, and allow for... I was just saying, so just to support you there. So essentially, when we're looking into the mirror using our eyesight, we're literally dimming our senses down for when we're sort of if we remove the mirror, then it forces our brain to literally choose and use all these other different senses in order to help us to actually do something properly. Kind of. Kind yeah, of. that's that's close to it. I wouldn't say the dimmer switch. I would say the central dimmer switch goes up okay. because the peripheral dimmer switches are down. Like the we want the inverse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So we want those peripheral dimmer switches because those are much more efficient. Okay. Right. Those peripheral dimmer switches we can bring up to a place where our body can illuminate from outside in and we can have full light and full capture of where we are in space. And we fill in the right. Dude, what? I know. Crazy. What? <laughs> oh god. It's funny because as humans, we obviously we just rely on our sight so much. So we're gonna right. like, oh, I'll get into there. Cause I always find that sometimes I'll have like um like I've had a lot of gym setups at like my my house or in like a, a shed or something. And I've always it's just as you were speaking, I've like I've had some of my best workouts where I've really connected into my muscles when it's just been like me looking at my muscles and right. and thinking about where everything is instead of looking in the mirror like, oh, just this, move that, do this. Yeah, I'm yeah. not going to squat in well, the mirror every just, day again. Just think of athletics, right? Like, I mean, I, this became really apparent to me when I started working with like professional athletes, primarily football, because that just seemed to be like my vocation. It's like some of the best plays in sports. It's like one of the, one of the markers of mastery is, you know, the, the idiom, oh, he can do it with his eyes closed. Right, like, dude, some of my favorite to athletes are just doing this. They're here, yeah. like looking in the camera, and they just pop. They bring it right in from like the third row, or like the no look shot, the no look pass. It's like, how do they do that? It's like, dude, that makes so much yeah. sense, it's especially like in terms of yeah, fitness competitions, because like when you're doing your posing or showing your body off. You're doing it on a stage, no one in the mirror, man. It's like no one's yeah. there. You're not doing anything. No. You can look. You, I've looked back on photos of myself and been like. Well, that pose heaps shitter than what I thought. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and everyone does it in a posing room with a body. Your posing room should be no mirrors. Yeah. Yeah, and just like a camera. Take some photos of yourself. Have a look afterwards. Yeah. Force yourself to adhere it to a shorter or a longer medium, uh, medium term memory. Like we, we know this intuitively. Like I'll use this tool with my clients. Like, look, I'm not saying mirrors are bad. It's just a tool, right? Like I have clients who, real good example, kettlebell bottom under press. It's a stability exercise that I really like, but sometimes it can be difficult. So I have someone who like, maybe, you know, maybe it's a five kilo kettlebell. They grab the handle and the bell is up here and it's unstable in the sense that the center of mass is, you know, seemingly deviating constantly outside of the base. Base is important. Yeah. You take someone that can get to the top and then the kettlebell starts to like fall out of their hands. Just put it in front of a mirror. They can start to fill in the gaps where those peripheral beacons aren't able to shine enough to overcome the lack of light from the central dimmer. And then we can start to use this other beacon to fill in for it until that one kind of, we fan that flame until it's high enough to take over. And then just next set, have them turn her up and then not use the mirror anymore. Yeah, it's it's okay. The, the, The brain is fucking amazing. Dude, right. that is so insane. There's so many things at the moment. <laughs> I'm finding my ego come up against me because I was literally going to ask you, I was about to ask you like, well, should I deadlift in front of a mirror? And I'm like, well, it depends. <laughs> I'm like, most, yeah. maybe, like sometimes. It's just a tool. But just then I was thinking, I was thinking that I was like, oh yes. And then I was like, you know what? Maybe for the next ones, don't. 
and and think about your body because one thing that I really understand um well that makes a bunch of sense to me is if I am training in in general and when I do close my eyes or I train and just think about my whole body in general and think about everything else and really think about where my um, movements are, I get a way better stimulus. I feel way better um, later on, and I always you want to know make what that way is? more progress. Yes, that's I'd love cere- to know what that is. That's that's your cerebral cerebellum. So your cerebral cerebellum has to do with your cerebral cortex, which is part of your cerebral cortex is your pre and primary motor cortex, which saves your motor pattern. And so they did a study in the eighties at a university in Chicago with basketball players. There's three divi- there's three cohorts. It was a thirty day study. And one cohort went and shot basketballs, free throws for an hour every day for 30 days. The second one went out on the court and visualized it every day for 30 days. And the third cohort went out and did nothing. And the free throw, actually shooting free throws improved 24% in 30 days. The visualization improved 23%. And then what we thought would happen in the last group happened and nothing, there was no improvement. But it's like, that is, you know, that is significantly close to actually going out and doing it. Because what they're doing is they're actually going through and focusing on uh, the cerebrocerebellum's input and bringing this beacon from inside the brain to the cerebellum, right? We were talking about before bringing the beacons from, you know, the peripheral proprioceptors from your hips, knees, shoulders, spine, ankles, what big toe, whatever. This is just another beacon that shines from here. This is a, your, and the nice part about that visualization is that you can shine that light without accumulating any peripheral fatigue that actually uh, that that actually will denigrate the technique of the movement. So if you went out and shot free throws for three hours and it was good for an hour and shit for two hours, you'd probably be better off visualizing for two hours because you're just going to practice good practice and that, and that you're not going to diminish any of those peripheral flames shining that light back up into the cerebellum. How sick is that? What? Come on. <laughs> so are you telling me just to visualize going to the gym and not actually go to the gym, man? Like, dude, but look at, dude, look at who's, do you have a favorite bodybuilder? Yeah, dude, I, I have, I have quite a few that I really look up to, but yeah, definitely like, like obviously Ben Pakulski has got to be one of them and you know, visualization king, man. Fucking <laughs> asshole. Love him to death. <laughs> but it like, dude, success leaves clues, man. And I think if we can start to understand the nerve and like look, a nervous system mapping is incredibly difficult. Like, you know, it's one thing to talk about bicep, short and length and mid range. Cause we've heard the word bicep before. Spino, Sarah, what do you like? It's, it's a whole new, it's a whole new language, but it, it gives rise to mechanisms and principles behind things that we just see repeated through time. But there's a reason, there's a reason people do this. And like, look, I love Ben to death. He's like one of my favorite people on this planet. I've learned so much from him. But I also learned where I needed to know more. And that was one of them. Like, because like, you know, he's just a big dude that doesn't wear shoes and is like kind of like a, this big hippie. And I was like, what? It, I know it works. Like, I've seen this guy not train for like months. And we were in Perth training at like 4 a.m. And, you know, he'd throw like nine, 10 plates up on a hack squat at like 5 a.m. in the morning in Dory's in Perth. <laughs> and he would just take a minute. And, you know, he would take like a few seconds before the set. And I'm like, God, just, and I was like, God, you just fucking lift already. God, enough with this stuff. And then I was like, and I started noticing, like, I'm a big Jordan Peters fan. Jordan Peters takes him there. And a lot of times they don't know why they do it other than that it fucking works, mm-hmm. which is like the hard thing with bodybuilders. Bodybuilders are always on this frontier of like just pushing the boundaries, but they don't know why. And that bothers me. So I just wanted to figure out why. And that's one of the reasons as to why that works. That visualization is just, it's going to be reinforcing that part of your, your movement brain in a really efficient fashion. It's going to slow, it's going to lower that central dimmer switch because you're going to have like accumulated, you know, an accumulative vibrance from the other three more efficient systems working collectively together. Dude, that just applies to so much other stuff. I'm reading like a Brian Tracy book at the moment and it's just like I've finally started to like look into the like learning how to sell and like sales because I'm like, yeah, I should probably do that because it's like part of my business. I should probably learn like a little bit, like at least the basics and the foundations. And and even in that, like that makes so much sense in, in terms of they do the same thing in terms of just like either speaking mantras or getting really focused or making sure that you're visualizing the success of the sale or visualizing the success for something that, that you really want in your life. And then after a certain period of time, they're like, it works. 
<laughs> and like they can't really explain it, but like that does. Yeah, it's, it's way better when you understand why. I think you just get more buy in when you when people understand the, the mechanisms behind it. I can't just say like part of this. My first job as a chiropractor was at Apple World Headquarters at Cupertino. So the computer I'm on, this fucking cell phone, I worked there. Whenever you open something that was like clearly made in China, but they say designed in California, I work with those cats. They're really, <laughs> really smart. Like really, really fucking smart. So like I came out of chiropractic college. I've been in school for, I don't know, nine years. And I had all of these like, I, I, you're Australian, I could say this. Like, do you, have any, do you know any people that are religious? Yes. Right. So have you heard of the God of the Gaps theory? Nope. I haven't heard of that. So like God of the Gaps theory is like this, uh, it's kind of like a Charles Dawkins-ism to kind of be like, well, when you back someone into a corner about religious reasoning, they go, well, God works in mysterious ways. Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> you know, like when they, can't, when they can't necessarily describe something, they sort of use that smoke bomb, right? So yeah. like the God of the Gaps theory, which is like, that doesn't really hold up. So with the people that I was working with, like, I literally remember this one dude. Uh, I can't say his name, but he had two PhDs from the, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. Incalculably smart. And I'm sitting there as like this fresh chiropractor call trying to tell him why he needs to do these things. And he's not, he's just curious to a fault. Yeah. And like, he's just a child. He's like, he's not a child. He's a fucking grown ass man. But he's like, yeah, but what, why? And like, I kind of ended up with like this weird chiropractic personal trainer, God of the gaps theory going on. I'm like, <laughs> I've reached the end of my understanding because I fucking told you so. And so that forced me to kind of dig a little bit deeper. And now when I sit with like, you know, the same dude, like I still keep in touch with him and I can explain to a level that he's expected to explain the things he does to him. He goes, oh, okay. And he goes and does it. and he gets great results. I love that. Man, you must, I would just be so interested in like, what do you actually think about while you're oh, training, bro? Like oh, when, when you're training and you're like, all right, I'm doing this exercise. I'm doing this for this reason, for that thing. Like you must be like, <laughs> I'd love to know what the inside of your mind looks like. What are you actually thinking about? When it's, you know, uh, it's complete opposite. It's, it's nothing. A, I've, I've, I've done all the thinking. Yeah. I can actually, it's cathartic. I just get to lift. Cause I think that's for me, it's like, that's what that's, that's like, that's the promised land. Like to yeah. me, I'm thinking sometimes it's like this, like it helps me drive further into sense. Cause it's like, it's not enough to know it. I don't think like, that's why I lift the way I lift and I eat the way I eat. And like hopefully, you know, look more like I want to look. Cause it's like, it's not enough to know it. Like, I'm sure that like, there's other people who know neuro mapping. They're just not 123 kilos. So it's like, as far as it needs to be concerned in our profession, it's like, well, what I think about is like, look, you, you bet. Cause this thing, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, none of it matters. None of the thinking I do matters. If I'm 70 kilos, yes. that's, that's, that's great. That's neat. Right. It's like reading a map in a country I've never been to. It's like, I don't need to know what the streets are in Marrakesh. If there are streets. <laughs> They've been there. Might not ever go. Doesn't really matter. So why do I? Why do I care if the spino Sarah whatever connects to the whatever? Yeah. If I'm not going to reside there, so it's like. So for me, it's it's actually training is very. Like, I think. I'm in like a, a metacognitive state a lot. Mm -hmm. I think about thinking itself, which is like a really weird awareness to have. Um, so it's sort of like you're meditating while you're lifting. I guess it's the absence. It's the space between the waves, yeah. right? It gives me things to think about after, but in the time I'm not thinking about anything, which is like a very nice. It's very I nice. like that. I enjoy. I so enjoy that. What other reasons? Like why? Why else do you live? Oh, it's get fucking huge. <laughs> just, 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 to get, just, to, just to be a sick cunt, right? Like, <laughs> just to be a beast. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know because I, I like I felt like I like lifting. I fell in love with lifting before I knew any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's just I don't know. I just enjoy it. Like I enjoy, I enjoy like the result of it. Like I enjoy it. It, it complements itself in a really weird way. Like I look like a fucking bikey. Like I'm well aware of that, but I can you know I can hopefully hang with most academics like in the field. So I just like the contrast. It's like how silly is this? But I look this way and, and say all these big words. So I don't know. It's, <laughs> It's it's fun. I like I enjoy like 
yeah, it's, you know, it's like you, I'm sure you're the same. Like it becomes more difficult to break plateaus and get stronger, bigger, leaner, whatever. So it's like, okay, I've reached a new threshold. How do I overcome it? It's like, you know, I've, I've run into an uh, outer border of my comprehension on something. Yeah. I just need to broaden that border and then I can put on more size and more strength. And yeah, it's, it's fun. Yeah, dude, I like respect that so much. Um, obviously, I, I, if you don't know, I research into a lot of like uh, old school philosophy and I research into a lot of myth and, and stuff like that. So I find it absolutely fascinating. And I really love um, how it was it played. Hey, how good is Mythos, man? How good yes. is it? Like Mythos, I'm doing Troy at the moment. I've gotten down to Troy and it's like, it's great. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's got all the good stuff. <laughs> Oi, dude, Beyond Good and Evil? Ridiculous. Yes. Yes. I haven't Let's done do Power Burst oh, This is actually a really good one if you're into it. What's that Zen one? Is that up a little bit higher? Yeah. Lift that one up a it's called bit. Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Ooh, it's Zen like, and it's, the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. I like it. Yeah. I really, uh, yeah, I dig on that stuff. Um, I can't believe you read Nietzsche, man. Dude, Nietzsche's my homeboy. I love that stuff. That's crazy. Nice. It's so intense reading. I'm like, yeah, cool. One book, five months. Law of, law of Attraction? Oh, yeah. Ooh. That one's a fucking, that one will level you, man. Beyond Good and Evil. Yeah. Yeah. No, great stuff. This is actually one of my favorites. If you haven't got a chance to read this. What is it? It's called uh, Walden. It's Walden and Civil Disobedience, but it's uh, it's Henry David Thoreau. Very yep. good book. It's uh, Walden. It's There's two books in one, but Walden is probably one of my favorite books. It has like one of my favorite quotes of all time. It's the mass of men seek lives of quiet desperation. Say that again. Is. Say that again. Say that again. It's, so the quote from the book, so uh, Henry David Thoreau lives, it's Walden is a lake and he goes and lives. He documents in a single calendar year, his two year experience of living by this Walden lake, completely shut off from society. And it's just, it's just him sort of having these thoughts while doing like very like menial tasks of like what you would have to do to stay alive if you live by a lake. This is one quote in the book. It says, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. I was like, oh, that, <laughs> that book will fucking do that. Get you right in the goods. Oh, dude, I love yeah. that. I'm going to have to upgrade my list now. God damn it. We'll <laughs> you we'll keep talk. going more books. You're like, oh, shit. <laughs> um, one of the things I was going to say, I, I was I'm pretty sure it was either a Plato or a Socrates quote, was that... You know, too much of an athlete, you become too much of a savage, and too much of a scholar, basically, you become too much of a nerd. And I love, and I really respect that about you. Is obviously you got the contrast with both, because I love that. I love kind of splitting things off into like body, mind, and business. And it's like if you can do that, in terms of like me growing up through my childhood and stuff, and I'm sure a lot of other people can relate. You just look at heroes, and you're like, oh god damn, I want to, I want to be like a hero. I want to be like that guy. I want to be like that person on this story that I've heard, or this TV thing that I that I saw, and blah blah blah. And if I look at all the different heroes through like all different genres, all different stories, a lot of them, especially the masculine ones, always are like either super smart, they're really strong and like they're extremely caring and like empathetic as well. And if you can like bring that or have like a mission that they serve that's beyond themselves, right? A bit of Frederick Nietzsche spice in there. So it's like, it, and when I see that in someone and, and I'm, I just get like super motivated myself to go out there and crush stuff and like, because you're doing that, man, I was just like, like, thank you for that. And like massive respect because I love that so much. Have you ever, you probably get a kick out of an author. Have you ever heard of the author Joseph Campbell? Yeah, dude. Yeah, Hero of a Thousand Faces. Yeah, done Hero of a Thousand Faces. The next book I'm reading actually by his, one of them is, I'm either going to do a Carl Jung book or Path to Your Bliss by Joseph Campbell. Path to Your Bliss. So, and now the interesting thing about that is before he died, he was, he regretted calling it Path, or um, what, so it was called Path to Your Bliss. Um what was the quote? It was, um, he'd meant to, and cause he'd, he'd only died probably in the last 20 years or so. Um, he wanted to call it path to your blisters. Oh, right. I like that. How, how good is that? Cause like, yeah. it is a really, so path to your bliss is good, but like he, you know, knowing that, you know, the, that he, after he regretted calling it that and he wished to call it path to your blisters. Yeah. was like fuck makes so much guy. more sense though because i've heard a lot of right. stories in the book and the general consensus of it is like yeah you will obviously want to follow your bliss but and everything's going to be hard so choose the hard path for the tasks that are going to be best for you it's, <laughs> it's the, like blis uh, the blisters that you want again man that already makes sense what's the what would be it's like um it's like henry the eighth right if you've ever read henry the eighth knights of the round table 
Oh, so Knights of the Round Table, classic. So, I, know, I know the story, uh, but I haven't read it. Do you know, st- you know the quote, Stir Kalinas Inventor? Nope. In, st- in Stir Kalinas Inventor is, in filth shall be found. Ooh, what yeah, am I okay. fit? Right. So it's basically the the Knights of the Round Table, that story is about finding the Holy Grail. Right? So yeah. like, whatever interpretation of the Holy Grail, the cup that Jesus drank out of or the the uh, something that held his blood, like his actual blood. It's, up for interpretation, but Henry the Eighth is you know that the round table. So him and all his like knights are all on the same level. They're all you know it's not like there's someone at the head of the table. And they the mission is like okay, we're pretty sure it's in this forest. We don't know where to start looking, and they're instructed to enter the forest at the place where they think it's darkest. So you have all these different dudes going in at different points, but it's all the same relative point to them because they all think it's darkest, and that's how they find. What cool is that? <laughs> Dude, I fucking love that. How, yeah, how would how would you apply true. that to yourself? Oh, oh man, yeah, like that's that's finding people around you who are willing to show you your blind spots, your dark spots. That's exactly those are the most valuable people you have. Is you know whether it's in a relationship, whether it's a therapist, whether it's a business mentor. It's like you know, I have I literally two hours ago. The reason I had to push back is I had a, a call with my business coach uh, you would hate if I called him that and it's the most uncomfortable hour of my entire week and it's the <laughs> one I hate and also look forward to the most and it's just yeah it's you know your body does things to protect itself from feeling pain and we know that from like a physiological level it's the same thing psychologically so it's just like you know you have someone just go let's talk about that how about that entrance way into the forest my friend and it's yeah it's it's fun man it's fun because if you can see it in the context of like the story right if you can see it in the context of the myth then you kind of kind of become the hero of that story yeah and it's it's i find it interesting that we're always constantly sort of um doing something that is in line with that that story it's just different parts of our lives we've mastered in diff- different areas like that's why i think actually going to the gym and having some sort of program and and actually doing it to the best of your ability um not just getting into the gym oh i want to get in shape but actually learning about it being interested and um going through and learning as much as you can because it it, it plays out in other areas of your life which can show up really well which is what i find that like a lot of um people who do have like you say optimized bodies strong bodies are extremely disciplined and um resilient in other areas of their life and they're not scared to you know either get hurt feel pain here or dive into something or know that something's going to get uncomfortable and then intentionally go and get uncomfortable and then come out and be like ah oh, that was so much better now that i've done that so. yeah it's sort of like a sisyphean story if you're into came or camu camu oh what's that sisyphus the myth of sisyphus pushing the rock up the hill yes yes yeah, yeah i know yeah, yeah. he's doing it forever yeah, <laughs> yeah. Still, but that's, that's what life is down. though yeah but that's life it's just like you, but the nice part is you get to choose the rock yeah i love that that's yeah. so good do you just as well before we um like like wrap it up i just wanted to get back onto the training stuff oh sure yeah just... i could do I, I could probably do more on the psych stuff honestly. yeah because there was just a question that i had that i really wanted to like ask you and and that was like do you always follow a specific program whilst you're training or do you sort of just go in there and like you have like either time off follow a program um or do you just sort of because you know like vast amounts you just get in there and be like you know what <clears throat> this today no it's always the program is always written from an intent base not an exercise base i think that's always something that people lack and they can't parse out the difference between the two so like i write my program based off of intent yeah so each movement has a specific intent because it's hard like i travel a lot so I don't have access to the same kit all the time. So I need to know how to make, to replicate that intent. So the stimulus stays relatively consistent to the muscle groups that I'm attempting to train in a particular block. Um, so I just, I write intent based program and it's really easy. You know, when you do it a lot, you can start to be like, Oh, okay. Like this, I, you know, in the gym I'm in now is like, I, I would say the best kit at out gym in the entire world. So pure muscle and fitness in uh, Burlington. So I have access to, you know, every type of resistance profile for better or for worse, because there's some machines that are complete rubbish, but you know, I can sit there and go like, Oh, okay. Like this machine is probably better arm path for my rhomboids. And it has like a decent resistance profile that matches kind of my strength curve. But if I, you know, if I'm in Dubai tomorrow and I'm at like a, 
or buy them out of Istanbul in June and like you know, not really the same fitness driven culture that we have in Canada. My goal is still to have some sort of favorable rhomboid bias initial pull for my exercise one of this program. I just need to be able to exact that intent by different means. So I just need to be able to fit that, put that square peg in a, in a square hole um, rather than just going in and just going, well, back workouts, back workout. I like to keep an intent base. And whether it's like strength focused is my reference point, whether it's some sort of like working through an injury is my reference point, hypertrophy is a reference point. And those reference points don't even need to be from like a, a macro or even meso perspective. It can actually be in a micro perspective. Like each exercise can have with it a different reference point. Like, you know, there are some ex exercises that are really good at eliciting trunk rotation that aren't the best lap movements. But if my reference point is improving trunk rotation, then it's a really good movement. Right. So like a single arm dumbbell row is kind of a shitty lap movement. It's not great. Like the amount of your elbow bends to how close your, or how much your elbow bends as the arc of shoulder extension works your lap to a shortened position, that decrease in distance between the dumbbell and your lat as your elbow bends as you row is nowhere near close enough to accommodate for the drop off and potential force output of your lat as a shortens. But it's fucking wicked at getting your trunk to rotate. So it's like, well, if that for so back day today, A1 is like improved trunk rotation. That'll set a way better. I tore my right pec three years ago prepping for the Arnold in Australia. And so I have crazy trunk rotation biases. So if I try and go through any other bilateral movement, it's going to be asymmetrical as fuck. So it's like, well, if I can just normalize the perception of my trunk rotation, like unilaterally, before I go into like some high output second machine row thing, I'm going to be way better off. So that's my intent of my first exercise. And everyone's like, ah, oh, dumbbell rows are shitty for your lats. It's like, well, screw you, nerd. I'm not trying to train my lats anyway. So fuck you. Like this reference point for this exercise is to improve trunk rotation. So it's, yeah, it's just, it's just fun. Like that's how I program is just based off of the intent. And then I can just cycle through any number of exercises and elicit the same intent as long as I understand how the external stimulus affects the internal environment. Dude, I love that. That, and, that, and that's insane so you sort of have like obviously depending on like the person and for you for yourself it's like i've got these certain exercises which have a certain intent for each one and then wherever i go wherever i'm doing i'll just slot whatever the intent is per exercise for what i'm doing and that's going to get me the best results yeah yeah i like that yeah, it's specificity over novelty i think is my approach yeah i love that well I'll start to wrap it up now, man. Otherwise, I'll get started on some more psych stuff and then I'll yeah, right. just get down the rabbit hole and I'll never get you off, uh, which is like, I'd benefit from that. But, um, dude, before, like, for anyone who's listening who wants to find you and follow you and stuff, where, where can they find you? Uh, Instagram is at the muscle doc, the underscore muscle underscore doc. Yep. And so mainly Instagram, you got a podcast as well. Yeah. Uh, RX Radio, iTunes, Spotify. Yeah. Uh, and YouTube, YouTube now as well. Yep, and I'll link yeah. all of those down in the description below for anyone who's listening if they want to find Jordan. So, man, dude, like, thank you so so much for coming on, sharing your wisdom, yeah, sharing, Pleasure, dude. sharing your knowledge. If you have any other quick quotes that you think off the top of your head that you've been reading or researching this week that you'd like to share, please share them. If not, then we'll wrap it up. If there's, if there's uh, one, one real good one. <laughs> nah, for me, it's actually whenever I do this, I have a, a buddy of mine who just – Go to MrMoProject.com and yeah. uh, I'm a big dog guy and I have a friend in the Northeast United States who rescues uh, elderly dogs from shelters. So just do that instead and yeah, if nothing else. Just just do that. Don't even go. To, don't even follow me on Instagram. Just go to Mr. So M R M O project.com and Chris Hughes. He likes, I think he might actually beat the people up who abuse them too, which is like, I don't know for sure, but he's fucking huge. He's like six, eight, like yeah, probably like 150 kilos. And so I'm pretty sure like he finds dogs that are being like elderly dogs that are in a bit of a rough spot and he rescues them. And then he might be beating the shit out of people who do that, which is like fucking nice. I'll pay into that all day. So yeah, <laughs> mrmoproject.com. It's funny. Um, you said I've seen um, Instagram photos of you with dogs before and you just go somewhere and you're like patting all these old, these old yeah. dogs. This is real cute, man. It's real good stuff. <laughs> My girlfriend started a the underscore muscle or the underscore muscle underscore dog instagram page <laughs> it's literally me the petting dogs. dogs and it's you this is massive guy just like patting all kinds of dogs around the world i love that i was like this is great i actually went and had a scroll i was like look at how many dogs are on here yeah oh, it's a day it's a daily thing I, I i i buy i don't currently own a dog but i buy dog treats 
just in case I run into friends. On just in case you run into another dog. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, oh, I like, if you're out somewhere social, and everyone's like, oh, imagine if someone had a dog treat in their pocket for dogs, and you're like, I do. <laughs> That's me. Never be too prepared. You can, <laughs> you can never find some be dogs too prepared. <laughs> oh, dude, I love that. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. Of course, man. Thanks for having me. Sick. Dude, that was dope. Thanks so much, dude. I love how you subtly just put in all of these like Australian references in there. Like you use kilos, you drop sick cunt, you drop all these other things. I was like, he's a pro. He knows Australians way too well. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yep. Oh, did you? Oh, nice. Yeah, I knew you'd been here quite a few times because I've seen like, um, like ages ago, like a bunch of seminars and stuff come up. Yep. Holy. Oh, yeah, yep. Oh, Jesus. Yep. <laughs> 